Greetings, as you heard, my name is Dan Van Voris. It is very exciting to be with you here in the virtual uh, Here We Still Stand Academy. Uh, a big shout out to all the teachers and everyone who has to do this kind of thing all the time. It's a weird way to teach, uh, but we're gonna do our best. A couple things, you're gonna notice that I have slides. Got a lot of pictures to show you and they're gonna be magically put up in all these different places as you watch. However, if you go to danvanvoris.com forward slash HWSS, here we still stand, 2020, you will be able to access all of the slides as I'm talking. So you can go and the very paper I have, you will have a, a copy of that to go along with. I am, as was perhaps already said, a historian by trade. This is not a sermon. And at the same time, it's not a lecture. It's one of the things I've always really enjoyed about Here We Still Stand is that it's a time for people to come and talk uh, academically, to talk in, 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 in theology, but not necessarily follow those sort of standard forms. So we're going to play around just a little bit with that today. All right, my topic. As you can see, first slide, my topic is monsters. Now, you might know that I wrote a book called Monsters a couple years ago. To say I wrote a book, it's more like angry screaming, uh, but it's, it's something that has kind of become a theme that has followed me, the idea of, of personal monsters, of corporate monsters, of being afraid. And then what the Christian faith says to those of us who are afraid of a lot of different things. So our topic today is freedom from monsters. And we're going to talk about some famous monsters. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of monsters, a little bit of monster movie, and then we're going to bring it all around to what's the good news? How do we find solace in the gospel in the face of monsters? And monsters sometimes that we do defeat and sometimes the ones we don't. So as I was given this topic for this year's conference, I, I knew monsters and I, I didn't want to do kind of what I've done before. And I was kind of stuck. I didn't know where to go with it. So I put it on the, the back burner and, uh, you know, it's quarantine. So we just, we sit around in, in soft pants and uh, snacks. And I ended up watching a whole bunch of movies. And I ended up getting, let me see. I'll start here. It started with RoboCop. Here we go. Slide started with RoboCop. He's, he's, a, he's a robot who's also a cop and, and a man. And uh, they thought this was a good idea. And they put him in Detroit in the mid 80s. And he's, uh, he's helpful and he's kind of sassy. And then they make a second one and it's kind of the same. And then the third one. And then they remake it. So I became fascinated with movies that had a whole bunch of French, a whole bunch of sequels, but I had never seen any of them. It's sort of like buying a box set of the police or something, right? When you know two of their songs. So this kind of became my, my thing. And so I started watching every franchise movie uh, I could come up with. And so that led me, uh, you know, to the standard ones, to the, the Star Treks, to the Friday the 13th, to the Evil Dead. And I, I just got really into this. And so I, I did something for you guys. Uh, if we go to slide number three, I made a bracket. That's right. If you look at this bracket, it's like uh, Sweet 16 in college basketball. Uh, you can find there are four different categories if you look at it. Uh, the upper category is a horror movies, best horror franchises. Uh, the lower one is uh, uh, action franchises. The one on the top right is family comedy franchises. And then the bottom corner is epic superhero franchises. Now, a couple things. I didn't fill out the bracket. You can do that by yourself. You can do it now. You can do it and tune me out. The way they're seated is that the one seeds are the franchises that made the most money average for all of the movies in the franchise. So you see the one and you go to eight and you can go through that whole little bracket. I'll give you a, a hint, however. Uh, the answer, the, the right answer for the winner is uh, Star Wars. And I know that's not clever, uh, but it's like saying Michael Jordan's the best basketball player. It's just, it's just what it is. Uh, if you're curious, my final four, I've got uh, Halloween as the best horror franchise. That meets Jurassic Park, which is the best action franchise. 
That's one semifinal. The other semifinal is Back to the Future versus Star Wars. Star Wars beats Back to the Future. Halloween beats Jurassic Park and the Halloween Star Wars franchises. Go at it. So why was I, as I'm obsessing with movie franchises, I find myself really getting into the horror franchise. There's something about the horror movies, and it's a, it's a, it's a genre I've never dealt with much in my life before. I've never seen most of the horror franchises, but there was something about it that just that fascinated me. I mean, not only do you have with these horror franchises, it's not just three or four. It's, we'll go to the next slide. The horror films right? Look, we, we have a one, we have a two, we have a three. Friday the 13th has a 11 movies plus Jason versus Freddy. Um, one's the reboot. There's an eight hour documentary on all of the movies. You can really, really dig deep. So as I'm wondering, okay, I've got the Here We Still Stand talk and I've got the title Freedom from Monsters. Ah, uh, yeah, we could do the connection to fear the connection to these monster movies, because as I was watching, why can I watch 10 or 11 Friday the 13th? Now, it just might be an aesthetic, you know, blip uh, or problem of mine. But why do we find that horror movies, one, are popular? Two, you, you don't need really another script to do Jason 3, 4, 5, 6. You can play with it a little bit, but it's not like Mission Impossible or some such. It's just getting scared by the same scary dude in a similar way over and over and over again. And we found that just in terms of finances, in terms of box office, these are really, really popular. So the connection is that we like to be afraid. Sometimes we like to poke the monster. Sometimes we like to, to go a little bit further, to, to terrify ourselves. My, my wife, if you've met her, uh, Beth Ann, uh, she loves horror movies. She loves roller coasters. She loves anything that kind of takes her right to the edge. And just as she takes, it pulls her back. Now, I'm, I'm not that kind of guy. I, I, uh, I don't like roller coasters. I don't think they're a good idea. I don't think public fun, I, what, you know, what I'm saying. Uh, but there's that thing in people, right, that they want to watch. They want to be taken to the edge. And so I, I thought, hey, let's look at that question first. Why do we like these things? Why do we like to be scared? So next slide. Why do we like to be scared? Well, the picture you see right there is actually a cave drawing of a winged monster from millennia ago. You can find it in Utah uh, in a, a cave. Uh, cave paintings across the world have these strange creatures and maybe they're telling stories. Maybe they're, they're trying to scare each other the same way that we've done with literature. As far back as we have any kind of art or human record, we have people trying to scare people for various reasons, but one is for entertainment. In the Middle Ages, there was a form of art that came after the Black Death or towards the end of the Black Death. It's a, a kind of um, uh, art known as the memento Mori, that is, uh, the remembrance of death. Pictures that show you in visual form that you, the watcher, are going to die. It's very, it's very macabre. There's a great scene in The Seventh Seal, Bergman's film, uh, which I highly recommend. It's black and white, but it's uh, uh, actually a commentary on sort of nuclear issues. Uh, but using the Black Death, it's fascinating. And there's a picture, there's a time where a guy's drawing these terrible, terrible pictures, and the knight comes up to him and says, what, what are you doing? Why are you drawing that? And the guy turns around with a big grin, and he said, it's what the people like. As long as there has been art or storytelling, there have been monster movie, or monster stories, horror stories. Uh, Martin Luther, we're all required to mention him at least once. So whoever's writing those notes, I've done it. Uh, Martin Luther loved talking about monsters. No kidding. We have in his, because you know, Luther gets, can get kind of kooky. And he has um, writings about monsters, of stories he's heard, of a baby born with goat's hooves or a, a person born with uh, horns or, or what have you. And these kinds of stories were all over early modern Europe. 
But Luther went a step further. Well, and a lot of folks went a step further. They said, this is, God is telling us something. Now, a lot of them thought the end of the world was coming, yada, yada, yada. But they thought this is, this is more than just something that scares us. Luther draws attention to the idea that the word monster, of course, he's writing in German, so but stay with me here. The word monster, the word we use, has the same root word as the word demonstrate, demonstrate, monster. Monster comes from the, the very word, which means to show. Luther thought of monsters as visual sermons. Probably not law gospel sermons, but sermons nonetheless. Maybe sermons meant to terrify you. As long as we've had stories and writings and reformations, we've dealt with monsters. Of course, as soon as we start writing novels, the modern novel, what are some of the, the, the first novels we write? Of course, you might know the story of uh, Frankenstein and, and a number of books and how they came together, that it was, uh, was it Mary Shelley and Percy, and they went to, I should have written this down before I talked to you as a teacher, but here's what happens. It's a summertime and a volcano has gone off far away, but it leads to what they say in Europe is called the, the summer uh, without a summer, the year without a summer. And so these people decided to go out to a lake to go to a, a kind of almost like haunted house and to scare each other with stories. And the stories they made up there became some of our most famous uh, ghost stories. Frankenstein is one of them. As soon as we started making movies in the late 1800s, in the early 20th century, what were the topics? Well, they were usually uh, nudity or monsters. Those are the early films we have. You're either going to, you're, you're going to be titillated in some fashion. Right? The movies were being made for the paying audience, and the paying audience wanted to be scared. Think of uh, Nosferatu, one of the, the earliest silent films, or the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. So why do we like this? Well, what, what does it do for us? You might already be thinking, well, it gives me a rush of endorphins or it's fun. So I looked to the psychologists and the psychologists have various answers as you might expect. And so we go to the next slide. And the question is, why are we scared? There's the terrified woman. And we have some, some notes here. Why are we scared? One, because there's a safety net. Why do we like to be scared, rather? Because there's a safety net. When I'm watching something scary, when I'm on a roller coaster, when there's something that would normally be terrifying, but I know it's not really, it allows me those feelings without the fear. Uh, it could be the flood, as we say here, the flood of dopamine. There are people who can't get enough of these things. They've done studies on people going into haunted houses and those who want to go, they're just, their brain is just lighting up. It's like, it's like taking drugs, almost the same chemical reaction. It could be that you're pushing the envelope. It could just be closeness with others. What happens when you get scared, right? A scary movie, right? The old cliche about the guy with the scary movie. So the girl uh, cuddles him, uh, closeness with those, self-satisfaction, maybe just Curiosity. So as you think about those things that scare you, right? Maybe it is in a fun way. Maybe it's not, I can't believe my wife or my kids like this and I don't. I, I want to direct our attention to something a little more specific. And if, if you don't want to go here, well, that's the advantage, I suppose, of having it being digital. Um, but I'm, I'm going to ask that for us to take a minute and go, go dark. Uh, the next slide here we see uh, Edvard Munch, of course, that is the Scream, uh, very familiar painting. Uh, if you didn't know, it was actually painted uh, during a plague. And this was his response to both the, uh, the, the physical toll and the communal toll. We can, we can joke about what we're afraid of and we can make movie uh, brackets and the like. But I want to ask you, what terrifies you? I was asking my wife about this and uh, she said, there are certain things in certain movies, no matter how much she loves to be afraid. There are some places where it just goes 
too dark. There are certain places, certain, I don't know, episodes of SVU or certain, su certain subject matter that is off limits. Now, it could be off limits for a lot of reasons. Perhaps it's just profane. Perhaps it's pornographic. There, there are reasons. But I mean, what's that thing that kind of turns it? It's just you don't, and we don't need to all open up right now. Obviously, this is the advantage of not having anyone actually here. Well, I'm going to suggest that in our fears, in our real fears, and the fears that the stories and the movies tickle, there are two kinds. There are prepared fears and social fears. The prepared fears are those fears that psychologists and sociologists, no matter where they go, time or space, age, culture, there are certain fears that are, seem to just be hardwired in us. We can go to this list here of prepared fears. Fear of the dark, squishy things, deformity, snakes, rats, etc. These are the things that terrify my sons when I ask them what scares them the most. It wasn't the crashing of a global economy or what have you. It was crawly things. Stephen King, in a foreword to a collection of stories, told readers that when he goes to bed at night, he is still, quote, at pains to be sure that my legs are under the blankets after the lights go out. I am not a child anymore, but I don't like to sleep with one leg sticking out. This is Stephen King. The thing under my bed waiting to grab my ankle isn't real. I know that. And I also know that if I'm careful to keep my foot under the covers, it will never be able to grab my ankle. Stephen King admitting, the, the king of horror, saying, yeah, there are those weird things. Now, evolutionary psychologists suggest that this fear is actually kind of a good thing. That it was developed, that we have to be afraid. We'll get to that in just a, little, uh, a second. But there are different kinds of fears, and maybe depending on where you are, some of the prepared fears you've passed, but it's those social fears. A college just down the road from me in Orange County, Chapman University, did a survey of American fears in 2016. We can look at that slide now. Now, there's a reason you can go and look at this on your uh, on your phone or what have you later and, and see some of the specific data. But what scares people the most? Adults in America in 2016, Chapman suggests that it is corruption of government officials. We've got terrorist attacks, inadequate funds, gun control, loved ones dying, economic collapse, identity theft, a loved one being seriously ill or I love this one, 35% of the population is terrified of the Affordable Care, Affordable Health Care Act, or its opposite, depending on where you are. What is this telling us? One, that social fears are real, that cultural feels, uh, fears, cultural fears are shared. And two, in a way, we, we like this. We like these fears. And I'll tell you how I know that. I've seen the television ratings for news programs. It's fear pornography. We love it because wherever we are on the spectrum, on the political scale, we say, ooh, they're the scary one. And then we get existentially freaked out. Prepared fears, creepy crawly things, social cultural fears, those things that we still like but have a slightly different domain. Now, as I said, fear is likely a very necessary and helpful thing. If we go to the next slide, however, uh, this study suggests that it's not bad that we have fear, we're just stupid, and we are afraid of the wrong things. So as you look at this slide, you can see things like, what are the chances that you die in a, in a plane crash? It's something like one in 11 million. What are the chances you have your identity stolen? That's one in 20. Uh, Fear, like pain, is necessary, but it's kind of like the difference between lifting weights and having someone throw weights at you, right? Like they, they both can hurt, both exercises, but only one is, is really good for you. So we do want to ask the question when we talk about the things we're afraid of is what are those things that maybe we don't need to be afraid of? But then, of course, what are those monsters that terrify us? And you'll see as we move here, I'm transitioning from general horror to monsters in particular.
we look at the next slide. Quote, monsters are nothing but the shadows of their master, death. We are fascinated with monsters because they represent our mortality. You can see here there are four different categories. Are you afraid of nature? Are you afraid of science? Are you afraid of the past? Are you afraid of the self? Nature, what are those films? What are those stories? How about Jaws? How about some natural abnormality like the chupacabra or Bigfoot? Nature gone mad and coming to get you. Or, or science, science gone wrong. This is Frankenstein. These are our science fiction dystopias with, with AI run amok. This is Godzilla, right? It's a response to the bombing of, of Hiroshima and, and sort of what that might bring. The past, how are we afraid of the past? Dracula, the dead, zombies, something from back then that's attacking us now. And of course, one that for me is personally maybe the scariest, that is the category of the self. Think Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Think Medusa. Think people that were once normal, that something happened and they were so turned in on themselves. They were so, they were made so grotesque that they terrified themselves. As I was watching an eight-hour, the aforementioned eight-hour documentary uh, on Friday the 13th, uh, John Carpenter, who is not a Friday the 13th guy, he's the Halloween guy, of course. Uh, they asked him about horror films. They asked him about the genre, this breakdown of science and nature and past and self. And if we go to the next slide, we can see his quote. He says, ultimately, it comes down to being afraid of something out there or in here. And John Carpenter is telling us that Everything breaks down into that. You're afraid of something external or you're afraid of something internal. Now, perhaps here we could talk about monsters and the defeating of monsters and how we uh, defeat our own monsters. Of course, we also want to talk about how we help other people deal with their monsters. But there are seasons for these things. There are seasons for, your own, for fighting your own monster. There are seasons for helping others. Well, fighting our own monsters, we're going to get to. When it comes to helping others, I like the example of Dr. Van Helsing. As a matter of fact, I think Dr. Van Helsing takes us to the freedom of the Christian in light of monsters. If you know Van Helsing, of course, he is the uh, kind of hero in Dracula. He is the, the arch nemesis of Dracula. And he has come uh, not because he's been attacked, but because he happens to know a thing or two about this. And so he says, well, okay, I'll go with you guys. Let's see what this is. And I think I can kill him for you. It was an act of love in a way. Now, Van Helsing, if, if you don't know, is not a real person because that is pretend stuff. But there was a person that Bram Stoker made Van Helsing from. Right? There's a true character, a true person behind that. The man's name was Georg Andreas Helving. Right? Very close, Georg Andreas Helving. And he was a German pastor. He was a German Lutheran pastor, of all things. And Bram Stoker, through a friend, heard about this Georg Andreas Helving because of the story about what this pastor did when there were actually fears of vampires in what we would say maybe Eastern Germany today. A plague broke out, and amongst these people, there was the claim that the plague was on account of vampires. And they were lynching, killing people who they thought, it's a witch craze, they thought were vampires. Well, Hellwing was not only a Lutheran pastor, but like so many of these, <laughs> these old Lutherans, they always have like a, a, like a lab next to their study where they're doing alchemy and, and uh, trying to figure out the, you know, uh, who knows, you know, the, the future or, or, or the like. Well, he was interested in science. And so what the pastor did is he went to these people who were afraid of vampires and said, ah, da, 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 I, I'll show you the science. The, the vampires aren't, aren't real. <laughs> and, and maybe there's something else. And, and so I love that example 
of this guy who surely had to fight his own monsters, but in a time of need said, here's what we're going to do. I can bring my pastoral office. I can bring my scientific knowledge and we can take care of this. Well, what does this all mean? As a good Lutheran, that's where we're taught to bring things back to. And so we go to the next slide. What does all of this mean? It means we are all superstitious. We are all religious. And we're all afraid. Sure, you might remember a guy who used to live down the block who swears he's not religious at all, or someone who, you, maybe you're very normal, you've no superstition. Um, but I, I don't think that's the human condition. I think our fascination with horror, with monsters, with the self, being afraid of nature and science, it tells us that we're terrified. We're no different from, from sort of ancient people you know, hiding in a cave because they're afraid of the dark. We're very much the same. And maybe that's okay. Because here's one of the big takeaways. Admit you're scared. Admit you're afraid. Admit that you have monsters that you don't want to talk about. I don't know what it is. Usually at Here We Still Stand conferences, I just tell you all about my monsters and my problems, but we're not gonna, we're gonna try and you know move, move past that. We're all in a heap of trouble and we know it, so we're afraid. So what can we do about it? What's the answer? Next slide. What can we do about it? You see a picture there of a man and he's got a, a spear and somebody I know back home, you're like, oh, that's, you're, you're already explaining to your you know, son or daughter, what it is. Uh, that is a picture of Don Quixote. And what is he doing? He is attacking a windmill. And what word in the English language do we get from this foolish man attacking a windmill, which of course he thinks is a monster, but he can't kill a windmill. We get the word quixotic. Maybe foolish, like Don Quixote, tilting after windmills. The bad news, to continue that for one more second, sorry, um, is that sometimes your battles will, in fact, be quixotic. If I was like a multimillionaire teacher on the flashy religious television broadcast and what have you, I might say, here's how we get rid of all the monsters. And by the end of my series, you'll be monster free and loving it. The bad news is I, we live in tension. The now and the not yet between kingdoms. And in this time, I can't, we can't guarantee that everything will be solved and fixed. However, that does not mean that we give up. It just means we look harder for the better answers. A few tips. Go to the next slide. A few tips from a quixotic monster hunter. That's me. A few tips. What do you do when you're fighting it on your own? What do you do when you're helping someone else? Well, number one there is pray. Uh, at the end of the slide and on the website, you can see I've put together a whole list of, of verses. All right, so you can go to those and, and see. I'm what, what, when we're nervous, when we're afraid, Jesus tells us to bring it to our Father. What else? Arm yourself with the promises of God in Christ. That's the gospel. Don't do it alone if you don't have to. Even Don Quixote had Sancho Panza. Sancho Panza, sorry. Know that you might lose. It might be a lost cause. There might be a monster somewhere that you will be fighting for the rest of your life. You will die fighting that monster. It happens. Doesn't mean the promises aren't good. Help others fight their monsters, as we said before. You see a quote there, and this quote actually comes from 
uh, the second season of The Soul of Christianity, a, a podcast I do with Debbie Winrich. We were talking with Paul Ralph, who has three first names, and I always get them confused, which one is which. But Paul Ralph, he said, one of the things he likes about what we do, here, here we still stand at 1517, what all of us together like to do is that we like to fight with God on behalf of people. Not fight with people on behalf of God. We do not need to justify the ways of God to uh, other people and make sure those people are getting it right as much as we want to wrestle with God and show you this is what we do. Whether you're highborn or low, whether you have eight degrees or none, we want to help you. And that's where we're headed. But before we go there, one more little bit of warning. And this from a man who loved to study and talk about monsters, Frederick Nietzsche. Next slide. Here's a warning from this fellow. He says, whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process, he does not become a monster. And when you look into an abyss, the abyss always looks into you. What does that mean? Um, this stuff is dangerous. You, you don't, I, I don't want you to leave today or leave this conference and say, I'm going to make a list of all my monsters and take care of them. No, 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 they'll find you, okay? I'm not saying... You, be careful. It's okay to admit that you're terrified and scared, but if you don't let the gospel do its work... You're, it's a fool's errand, truly quixotic. Here it is. Next slide. What's the answer? The rumors of grace, forgiveness, and the redemption of all things are true. Everything is going to be okay. And I know I've said that uh, 500 times now in the Christian, just over 500 times in the Christian History Almanac uh, on my old podcast. And sometimes it's the stupidest cliche and it makes me angry that I've ever <laughs> thought that saying everything is going to be okay is actually okay when things are awful. No one's wor nothing's worse than someone spouting off a cliche. But the problem is it's true. The good news is better than you can imagine. The good news, quick, isn't that we get to, okay, we're going to fight monsters and get bloodied up and then whew, we die and we go off to heaven uh, where we're disembodied playing harps. Play a harp? I don't know. Uh, the, the truth is not that we're going to heaven. The truth is that heaven is coming to us. Check out those verses on the last slide if you want. Check out the book of Revelation filled with monsters. And the answer is not that we get whisked away to some other place, but this place where we're living, a new heavens and earth. Everything is going to be okay is a stupid cliche. The problem is it's true. Now, maybe everything is going to be okay because of the work of Christ, the promise of God. Maybe there are other ways we need to talk about it. Maybe there are ways we need to learn to translate the gospel to give to people who are afraid. And so my last thought here is as we're dealing with monsters, as we're trying to, to bring the gospel to ourselves or to others that says it might not be okay right now, but it's going to be, hold on to the promises. Maybe we need to think about the ways in which we talk. Next slide. See the picture there from the movie Goodwill Hunting. And if you've seen the movie, you know this scene most likely. It's Robin Williams, the psychiatrist, talking to the, the troubled but bright young uh, Will Hunting. And he, he never, Robin Williams' character can never, can never break through. And, and, and Matt Damon is just sort of, oh, let's get through this. And then finally, uh, Robin Williams' character says, it's not your fault. And Matt Damon starts to break down and says, don't say that. And Robin Williams keeps over and over saying, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And obviously there's more to that. That's just a phrase. But whatever was under that, for the guy that was hurting, 
That's what it did. For many of us who are here watching this, who have been to conferences, uh, you've grown up maybe in the evangelical church. You've grown up in the church in the 70s and 80s. And for people that grew up in the 70s and 80s, especially in places like where we are in Southern California, the language was sin. The goal was forgiveness. And we knew this. We know this. It's so deep in our blood that here at 1517, what do we like to say the most? Your sins are forgiven. Well, what do I have to? No, 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 no. Your sins are forgiven. For many, that is everything is going to be okay. That's what it means. And you can unpack it. You can have a longer conversation about what that means. But then there are other people who are not in the church or who are younger people who have not had the catechism or that they don't use words like sin. I I think there was a talk two years ago, um, I think it was here, uh, where they talked about the language of sin. What are other things you can tell someone who's fighting or tell yourself? It's not your fault. How about you aren't in trouble? I've got two young boys. Nothing stops them in their track like that. When you lead with that, and then you unpack it. You aren't alone. I see you. God sees you. This isn't okay, but you will be. Sure, they're all cliches. But they're all ways in which one person tries to say to another person, stop your worrying. It's really, you don't need to go looking for monsters. If you want to, because it's exciting or it's a a fun thing in in terms of, of films or movies, that's great. The personal monsters will get you. Maybe you're suffering with something right now. Maybe you were once. Maybe, (laughs) well, you probably will in the future. The very last slide has all the verses. I want you to read those verses. Look at the actual word of God telling you what I'm going to tell all monster hunters, victims of monsters, right now. And that is, I promise. Everything is going to be okay. Thank you so much for joining us. We are live with Dr. Dan Van Voorhis to talk about his uh, the talk that he just gave and ask a few questions. It's good to see you, Dan. Good to see you too, Kelsey. Yeah, Vera. Glad that you're here. Be, it's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, talk. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about monsters. Sure, yeah. I am curious. You talked a lot about... The, Robocop. Robocop. You did talk about yeah, that. I'm sorry. You also talked about the fact that sometimes when we fight monsters, it we will do it in foolishness or we'll be like Don Quixote. Yeah. Why is that still important for the Christian, even if we know we look like fools or we will be fools or that ah. the, the job itself is foolish. Yes. So there's two kinds of foolish, right? Yeah. There's the, there's the Christian foolishness, right? The foolishness of the cross. When we fight things knowing that we won't win in this lifetime, mm. when we do things that, that aren't maybe for our self-interest, but are for others yeah. or uh, embracing a way of forgiveness instead of a way of, of exacting law, uh, that's a kind of foolishness. And when we live according to the promises those monsters, those things we're fighting, if we look exotic, that's okay. Yeah. That, that's part of what Paul calls us to do. Um, there is a foolishness of saying, I'm going to defeat all my monsters, or I'm going to take on one a day, or right. I'm going to... And sometimes as Christians, we, we have this foolishness that we put on our back and think, well, the, this is Christian living. Um, and oftentimes that's more just kind of self-help talk. Yeah. Uh, and so... The point I think overall to make is that let's be foolish in the right way, yeah. but foolish embracing the way of the cross and the way of forgiveness and the way of what looks like futility sometimes yeah, and not always the victorious life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the fact that we are not, ourselves are not going to be the victors. It's Christ. That is Absolutely. Victory. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you think you're winning, uh, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, and that's, just keep it, keep, you know, you're going to get beat up. You're going to, you're going to lose. 
don't take your own temperature to decide how you're doing or, yeah. or how you know, look to the promises, right? That was one of the things. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about that that's very freeing, I think, yeah. to, to know like we're going to fight this, but we don't know exactly how it will turn out in this life. It, 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 uh, well, it's probably a lost cause. Yeah. Right? Even the things I'm best at, uh, I'm going to fail. Uh, but I don't, I don't mark myself off by, by how well I, I do things. Uh, yeah. Especially at, at, with regards to those things that terrify me. Right. Uh, there, there are some things I like to do and I don't consider them monsters. Now, they could become monsters in a way if I let them rule me. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are other things that are most definitely uh, scary things that I'm, I'm going to sometimes fight and sometimes run from. Um, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You also talked about, um, you kind of categorize our fears as fears from within or from without. Yes. I was thinking about that. It seems like underneath those, whatever the fear is, is kind of this pervasive fear of death, which yeah. we've already talked a lot about. We had a panel about it sure. yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm curious if, if you think that that in particular, that specifically, the fear of death is something that we need to, to face um, as a monster. Or we, oh, yeah, we no, that, to, that's the whole thing. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. You're not afraid of, uh, of Chucky because he's got a mean look. Uh, you're afraid that he's going to kill you. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> we're not afraid of these monsters. Like Jaws is going to ruin the summer, uh, you know, beach experience. It's because we're going to yeah. die. Yeah. So I think that um, yeah, death is the number one thing we need to, to look at. Now it's weird. And, and you could go to Freud here, this, this thing with a death drive mm. that, that secret we, secretly we all like to think about our own demise yeah. and how it's going to happen and sometimes push ourselves right to the end or watch scary things because there is something that fascinates us. Right. That, because that's the one unbeatable foe. Yeah. Right? Yeah. One of the reasons I like monster movies is that, well, I was going to say they always die in the end, but then there's Michael Myers and, and Jason and they don't have Freddy. They don't always die in the end. Uh, but at, there, there's some kind of uh, defeat of the monster. Right. And the, the, the sucky thing about our life for reals, IRL, as they say, is that <laughs> we, uh, we uh, <laughs> no one's in the room. So I don't, LOL. Think, I don't think anyone's watching us. And so I just feel like I could say whatever That's I want. That's how I feel let me, tell you about, uh, let me tell you about my wife. She, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, we, we, we are going to die. It seems a silly thing to make a point of. Um, but that's why we're afraid of everything. Yeah. Uh, and even those little fears we have are ultimately pointing us. They're tied to, to that. Yeah. And that's, that was the quote that I had um, that I didn't attribute on the, the slide. And I'll, I forget who it's from. Uh, <laughs> but it's just that monsters are just a reflection. They're just a shadow of yeah. their ultimate master, death. Right. Death is the big baddie. Yeah. And uh, that's why saying that we have Christian freedom from death. Is important. From monsters is paramount yeah uh, when it comes to the existential situation yeah yeah you, um it seems like the Nietzsche quote that you you mentioned alludes to the idea that when we approach monsters um on our own terms or by our own means when we yeah. do it in that way it can lead us down dangerous paths yeah um can you talk a little bit more about those dangers yeah. of fighting monsters sure. on your own. Okay, so two places. One thing is, at some point or another, we're all going to be alone. There are some people who can't do things with other people in a way that others can. Yeah. And so I don't want to make this law yeah. that if you're going to do this, you have to do it with a buddy. Right. You know, kind of like scuba diving lessons. Um, <laughs> I, I've that never, is important. I've never scuba dived, but I don't. <laughs> you need I other people that for that, for you, sure. You that is a law that we why? should live by. I, well, I... Talk to us later if you've scuba dived. Um, <laughs> where were we? Scuba divers. Um, no, the, the doing it on your own. And the great promise is that we're never alone as Christians. Yeah. That the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is personal, right? I mean, it is important language that we use. So never be afraid or, or despondent when you are alone because you're not yeah. uh, in Christ and through the Holy Spirit. Um, but there's something really, really helpful to doing things together yeah. with other people who can help you when you can't help yourself. I talked about it last year at the conference, but one of the most encouraging stories for me in the New Testament is that of the, the paralytic 
and the friends bringing the paralytic to Jesus and taking him up on the roof and lowering him down. They're doing all this for him. Mm -hmm. And then it says, when Jesus saw their faith, right? He forgave his sins. Oh, now, I don't want to make a whole theology out of that because we could get into trouble, but it's in the text. Yeah. And there's something about the, com- the, the communion of saints. Right. So we do this together because um, we, we need someone else's perspective. Yeah. We need some. I, I see my, when I watch myself on these things, I always feel like, oh, I look so confident, but I'm, <laughs> I'm <just> ter- <laughs> terribly broken and scared inside. Um, but it's going to be at different times. And so 15, 17 your local church, your friends. The, yeah. The, well, yeah, I was yeah. going to ask, how do we do that now in this year where, I mean, you know, we, we are isolated more than we, we ever have been because we, we have to be yeah. a little bit. How do, we, how do we find people to fight together? What's I, your recommendation? I mean, I can make a list and say like, do this. Zoom and yeah. DM and, and those stuff. The answer is it just sucks. Yeah. <laughs> just sucks. <laughs> But as a Christian, as someone who has an understanding of the world as terribly broken in need of a savior and with one, um, I can just look at the mess and say, yeah. 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 What is it? Mama said there'd be days like this, right? right. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the, we weren't promised anything but uh, this sometimes. Yeah. And this year's, uh, there's no one here. And so I almost said a bad word because it's just me and you <laughs> talking. Um, but, um, but this year is, it's rough. Rough. There you go. <laughs> and, and sometimes you just have to say, oh, dear heavens. Yeah. And that's the way it's across. That's calling a thing what it is. Yeah. It's saying yeah. this is not easy. Yeah. And not trying to make, I think that that's, you, we, I think we all kind of oscillate between saying like, well, other people have it worse and it, it's getting better, but it's okay to just say it's really hard. Yeah, we love, we love, uh, it, it's, I'll be dating myself by saying behind the music. This was something we, we oldsters used to watch. And it was, they would take Millie Vanilli or Meatloaf, which is the best one of all of them. And uh, VH1, they'd tell you like a 45 minute hour long story about the band. Okay. And it would always go kind of, things were great. And then they got bad. And then they got great again. Yeah. And you just kind of expect this in an hour that if it gets bad, it's like the weather in Scotland, to just wait around for 15 minutes and it'll change. Yeah. That's not always the case. Right. Sometimes we have long, crappy seasons where <laughs> nothing is going right and we can wait and wait and it's, read the Psalms. Yeah. <laughs> this is David saying, I thought it was going to get better. Yeah. I'm David. Um, so... Chef's table does that too. Chef's table. Yeah. I don't know chef's table. I don't, I don't watch. Ba- let's let. I don't watch baking shows, but that's another conversation <laughs> for another time. You should. They're I, very. They're I, very helpful, especially in 2020. 2020. All right. I, I hear that people like. Okay. What's <laughs> anyway, for the sake of the, the, the listener? Next question. Um, you you talked, and I loved how you talked about unpacking the Christian or doctrinal language of sin and forgiveness for people. So. Yes changing it from the way we internally talk about it in the church to a way that people can understand. Um, I think that's so useful and helpful in today's world where we see more and more people who we could call nuns or secular who just don't even have the background of this language. N-O-N-E-S. Yes, Yes, nuns, yeah. yeah. Uh, Those other nuns are pretty religious. Yeah, yeah. Um, But I, I have found myself personally struggling from getting in a conversation with someone from it's not your fault or it's going to be okay to the reason it's going to be yeah. okay. Can you, what, what's your advice sure. to kind of bridge that? So that the, the idea there isn't that our language is insufficient. I, I like our language. Yeah. I think yeah. our language of sin and forgiveness and redemption uh, is is beautiful stuff. But people aren't, uh, when I talk with with people <laughs> that are outside the church, they don't come to me and say, my transgressions are so many yeah. and I've been fornicating. Yeah. And you know, yeah. they just, they don't use that language. And so you have to come up with a way of translating. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's what doing theology is in a way. Right. It's translating the truths to the person that needs it. Mm-hmm. Um, and oftentimes I, 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 I sometimes cringe at how often I say everything is going to be okay, and then I put it in my talks, but it's really all, all I got. Yeah. 
um, because from there I can get you to Jesus. Yeah. From there we can say, why, why is that comforting? Oh, it's because you know, things are not okay. Yeah. Because you know, things right now are bad. And so there's no trick. Right. Right. There's no like apologetic gotcha. There's a conversation to be had with people who are hurting and to tell them in all the words we have. And, and this is why I love catechism and I love getting into the riches of church history because there are so many ways to talk about these things. Yeah. So let's not pretend that there's just one, one way, way to talk about this, but ultimately we're talking about the same thing, forgiveness right. of sins, yeah. uh, the life in the new kingdom. Uh, but, but the transition is important. Yeah. You have to say, even if you want to keep it simple, because of Jesus. Yeah. Why is everything going to be okay? Because of Jesus. Well, what about Jesus? Well, he was God and man who lived a perfect life and death and rose again. You need to get there. Right. Um, and maybe that yeah. that takes time and relationship. I think I I there is a sense of fear in that transition, though, because I think my fear is if I mention that, it cuts the conversation off. Like yeah. they, they won't be interested anymore. But I think maybe that's where relationship comes in and the fact that we're spending time with people do you think possibly too? It's because Jesus people have been very strange. Yeah. <laughs> um, and 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 sometimes Tell us more in, what you some, mean by that. <laughs> sometimes in an okay way, and sometimes in a not very good way, and sometimes it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to say that I'm a Christian because what I'm saying is I can't forgive my own sins. I will be dependent on my Father forever. Yeah. I won't grow up. You know. I mean, those are embarrassing things. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes I feel like we get embarrassed for other reasons. We get embarrassed about other things about like, you know, oh, they're going to think I like Striper or uh, it's a thing from, uh, or they're going to think I like, uh, I don't know, any modern. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but there are things, right, my thing. sometimes there's, there's, there's just cultural yeah. problems and there's cultural with, with you know, I don't want to, stuff on television and, and Christianity can look super lame. Now, it will look lame in a different kind of way, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in that we can't save ourselves and we've got a sin problem and we're going to die. Uh, but I, when it looks lame the other way, then it makes me nervous and that's yeah, that's a dilemma. Yeah. But just get right to it. Just yeah. tell the person, yeah. we're all going to die. Everything <laughs> sucks. Uh, Jesus <laughs> is the answer for the p- a specific problem. Uh, and I'd love to talk about it. Yeah. But, you know, what is the, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Um, that message doesn't seem to work very often. No, no, not at all. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> or if it does work for a person, then they've got it, they've got it wrong. Yeah. Um, but if you want to use that cliche to say, God loves you in Christ and has a wonderful plan for your life after this valley of tears, yeah. right? You can translate it. Yeah. And that's what we, so use what that phrase, about. but then get to the point of, uh, here's why it's going to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that distinction is important between the fact that we're translating one message. We're not. We're not saying. We're not changing the one message into many. We're. Yeah. We're going to continue to say the same thing over and over again, just yeah. in different ways. I think that's really important. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the phrase "everything is going to be okay." Sure. And um, how how can we help people understand that the generality of that, which it is general, yeah. but true. How how does that apply to them specifically? Well, two things. I'll say if you if you go to the website, the danmedvoris.com forward slash HWSS 2020, I've got the Bible verses at the very end. Yes. And that, that's yeah. ultimately where where it is. Um, that's what we have to tell people why everything's gonna be okay. And and I've done this before, but when we say everything is going to be okay, we're saying everything, not some things. Yeah. We're saying is going to be, not is now, and is gonna be okay, is gonna be healed, is gonna be all clear, which is what okay initially stands for. It's a long story, but another time. Um, when you understand it like that and then say, well, why? <laughs> Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. And we just keep going to the cross. Yeah. We keep going to the verses. Yeah. Um, but as I mentioned in the talk, there are all sorts of ways of saying this. How do you and your friends talk? What, what can you bring in from culture or from other places and, um, and, and hit that person in the right spot? Right. Where is that sweet spot for that person? And sometimes it takes language, different kinds of language, translations, and, and relationships. Yeah. 
That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Fan, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I do a podcast called, yes. uh, called the Christian okay. History Almanac every single day. Every day. And every day. Seven days <laughs> can, a week. You can listen to it. And also The Soul of Christianity, which we're finishing up right now, uh, season three. So check that out. And what is season three going to be Season on? three is on the Lord's Prayer. Okay. And so it's Debbie talking with our friends from uh, Ken Jones to uh, Stephen Paulson to our new friend Gretchen Ronovic, who also does a podcast. Yep. It's lots of fun. So Great. Plugged. Please check those out, and we will be back after a quick break. <laughs> 